All right. Good morning or good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. My name is Brian Monkapunsuk, Customer Success Manager here at Kativ Technologies. I'm also joined by our good friend, Christopher Marion, Technical Sales Specialist over at Autodesk. Hey, Chris. Hey, Brian. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for hopping on. Thanks for joining. Uh, so this is our Kativ Virtual Academy, our weekly webinars where we um, go into educating the community on technology workflow, whether it's Autodesk workflow, we have one dedicated, you to have one dedicated for our ANSYS workflows and things like that. Uh, and today we'll be diving into uh, what's new in Fusion 360 for both design and manufacturing uh, from January all the way to the present day today. So uh, here's a quick high level uh, agenda of what we'll be talking about. Um, we'll spend about 15 to 20 minutes each. I'll be going first, going over design, and then Chris will be taking over to talk about manufacturing. Uh, and then if you have any questions whatsoever, go ahead and put them in the Q&A um, tool here in Zoom, and then we can try to address that at the end. Uh, we want to try to keep it um, streamlined so that when you do review this on when it's uploaded to YouTube, uh, it just goes through all the content, and then we can have those questions for the end. All right, uh, with that said, we'll go ahead and do quick introductions and we'll dive into it. So um, I've been at KT for uh, close to six years now, actually. Um, I'm a customer success manager to help with the adoption of tools and services that we provide our customers. Um, I was hired on previously as an application engineer for Fusion 360. Uh, and then a fun fact about me, I have about five 3D printers at home, two of which I still use. The other ones are just there. Um, so I'll go ahead and let Chris introduce himself. Yeah, so funny enough, um, I, I started out in the architectural design side of things. Um, but starting in high school is when I kind of really got attracted to um, technical things, right? So I started uh, really getting involved in the drafting side of things. So I decided to go into the architectural side of things. But quickly after school, um, after I finished college, uh, finding a job was, was fairly difficult. So I ended up getting a job just in a local machine shop. And um, I had the opportunity of kind of going to one or two different directions. So in a mold shop, I could have went to tool making or I could go to machining. And um, when I was going through the tour and I saw the machining side of things, I was like, oh man, that's exactly what I want to do right there. So I ended up taking that up thinking it would just kind of be like a short term type deal, but here I am, you know, almost uh, it's 25 years later. So I, I kind of worked on the, the machining side of things, kind of worked my way up from just an operator to uh, programming five axis mills simultaneously, uh, work in design. And then I kind of finished up there uh, working as a continuous improver, kind of looking at reviewing existing processes and looking at, you know, future processes at that place. Um, and then I went to go work for Delcam, which was acquired by Autodesk. So some of you might have spoken to me on the phone while back, you know, when I was doing my customer support thing at uh, Autodesk. If not, um, you know, nice to meet you all today. So, but um, mainly my, uh, my expertise is on the, uh, the make products, so the Delcam products, but as well as Fusion 360, uh, mainly on the subtractive space. So that's an overall nutshell of uh, who I am and where I came from. Thank you, Chris. And yeah, your story of, you know, alert starting it from all the way back in high school is similar to mine. I started mine at AutoCAD in high school. So, so that it's, it's crazy how, you know, high yeah, school, life, the high school experience kind of pushed our way towards exactly. where we are today. Life's always full of twists and turns, right? Yeah. Just you deal with them as they come. So you're right. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. So here's just a lot of words here on the screen. I'm not gonna dive into everything, uh, but here's everything that's what's new for the design side. Uh, I'm going to show some, uh, mention some, uh, and then I'll break it up to be more digestible for you. So uh, I'll go ahead and dive into my uh, side of the design. Uh, and then uh, in about 15, 20 minutes, I'll pass it over to Chris. So, um, the first notable uh, what's new in January is the product design extension. 
and that comes with a lot of plastics uh like including boss where you can create um these kind of holes that can connect to the front uh to the top and bottom of a of a case for example and it even comes with a screw which i'll be showing uh and other things like that so let me go ahead and just go ahead and pull up fusion 360 and i'll show you where you can access this so with all the extensions it's a pay as you go kind of method unless you want to just go for the whole year uh renewal um but here's the product design extension um there's some plastic rules that you saw on the screen um we're going to go into volumetric lattice things like that so this came out in january so it's it's been out for a bit and it's been updated uh, the last couple of months as well uh to to always be improved so uh once you once you purchase it with cloud credits and and what is going to be now flex tokens which will which i'll briefly mention later in this presentation um you can access your uh product designs these are all kind of persona based uh so if you're you're more into nesting you can you can purchase that extension so with that said we're going to first go into boss so i'll be hopping between the screens here here and there but um so if you go here to plastic we can see that the there's this boss feature there and it kind of gives you a little uh, preview of what it can do i don't know how uh, people are able to create the algorithms for this it's really uh, easy to use and it's really uh, uh, e uh, really crazy uh, what result you can get from it so all i did was click boss right now i will go ahead and show my sketches and i'm just going to use the sketches that uh, that came from a project so I'm just gonna select these points here. It's looking for sketch points for boss. Select these four. So now it's giving us a preview thanks to this visibility tool here, leaving that turned on of the, the model it'll add to this model or to my uh, Arduino casing that I have here. Uh, and it's kind of like a section view. So this is a really clean way to view it. Uh, and it even comes with a screw, uh, the right size screw, um, or according to what you'd specified here, you can choose different heads as well. As you can see that head just enlarged it. There's like a washer one. We'll, we'll stick with the pan one, you did different drives um, and different hole types as well. And then later on, uh, they added ribs here as well. This is highly requested by, by customers to have supporting ribs uh, to the side of your bosses. If you'd like, uh, you can also flip. So if you want the screw to go from down to up, uh, you can flip it around with that tool there. So it's a really neat tool as part of the extension. And um, I, I have yet to create my own 3D print of this. I will definitely be using this uh, to test it out. And I might have a whole webinar dedicated to this in the near future. Um, but once I hit OK, it created all these um, bosses for us um, with honestly the click of a button. It was really, really quick and uh, easy to use. And then it, it came in with these linked um, pan Phillip threads. Um, so something I could buy off the shelf, which is really nice. And it looks like it's going a little too long there. So I can go down here to the boss. And I can just manually drag that up to maybe a shorter uh, thread there, a shorter length screw, uh, so it doesn't go all the way through. All right, so that's boss in a nutshell. Again, I, I could spend more time on it, um, but I just wanted to make you uh, aware of that. I have a little recording of it there. Uh, next is geometric pattern. Let's go back into fusion. So geometric pattern, you can it's easy to spot. Uh, it could even go on a curved surface uh, for this for our, our case here. We're just going to do it on uh, to create air holes for this Arduino uh, casing. I'll we'll go ahead and select that there. Select the face in which I want to create my air holes, and then. You can choose things that you don't really have in a regular rectangular pattern or circular pattern feature in Fusion. You can have this radial pattern, for example, 
Uh, and then, sorry, I, I kind of jumped the gun there. Let me choose the object type. Uh, so you can pattern spheres, uh, cylinders, a box. In this case, we're going to do cylinders. Uh, and it's going to give us a little preview of these oversized cylinders uh, that will go ahead and reduce. That increased it. Let's see. Let's toggle some of these and play around. That looks like a better one uh, to reduce it. You can play around and toggle with some of those. Uh, if it's sticking too far off the edge, like, like this one is right here, we can go ahead and hit clear perimeter. So then it, it only uh, creates these cylinders um, to the edge, up to the perimeter, hence the name. Uh, and then instead of creating a new body, which is it's about to do, we can go ahead and create uh, or, or do a cut operation instead. And then it's not liking the size limit there. Let me give it a value. Looks like that's a little too large, 0.1. That's about right. And we'll, we'll go ahead and hit OK and see what it's going to give us. And that's a nice little cut there. Uh, mind you, my thickness for my part might be a little too thick because if you look at the bottom here, it didn't cut it all the way through. Um, I didn't see specifically a through all feature. So maybe that's something I would want to look for. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a, uh, a number in here I can adjust to cut through all, but what I, what I like to do instead, or what I can do instead, is I can just highlight them this way. Let me, let me uh, suppress my bosses for now. I can highlight my faces this way. And with our direct edit modeling features in Fusion, I could just hit delete. And that was not like I practiced. <laughs> um, oh, that's interesting. Let me do that one more time. I see it's it's holding some of the boss features there. There we go. Thank goodness. Um, we'll unsuppress the boss. We could bring them back. Okay, maybe not. Anyways, we'll get into the details of that another time. But now we made holes that go all the way through. So if it gets hot, it can breathe. And that was just a cool design that. I don't know, honestly, how I would, maybe I would create a rectangular pattern of a line and then do a circular pattern. So it'd take definitely a couple of steps, whereas this tool just took one step, which is really nice. All right. Snap fit. This is one I was really looking forward to because um, I did a webinar on, on a manual snap fit that I created in Fusion. Now we have our own um, snap fit. Um, tool that you can just um, toggle on and off. So let's go ahead and uh, do that. So let me, let me pull this back. Let's just work with something simple here so you can see. Uh, and then we go here to snap fit. We can turn on the sketches again. And it's looking for sketch points. So let's go ahead and give it four snapping points. One, two, three, four. And if we take a look closely, this is actually not naturally what it's supposed to look like. It needs to be on the side. So we flip that around. Nope, that flips it upside down. If we rotate it maybe instead, there's, there's the rotate icon. Let me, let me work with this one here. I believe if I rotate it 90 degrees this way, there we go, it's giving us 90 there. That will go ahead and give us the right snap fit. Oh, mind you, you should only create it on one side. So let's pretend we're just working on this side for now. So I'm just going to hit okay here and it created a snap fit. Okay, this side's not correct, but this side's correct. It created a snap fit uh, that we can toggle maybe after printing and you can see, you know, if you want a, a more uh, abrupt snap or if you want something more loosely held together, you could adjust it with the settings that we saw there. Um, but let me go ahead and hide the body there. So then you can see what would be sticking out that would snap. 
to it. You maybe you can add some more, um, more material to it if you want it to be more sturdy, if you will. Um, but this kind of gives you a whole design for you, uh, so you don't have to go creating this manually yourself and hoping it would work. So this is uh, definitely heading in the right directions for those of you who who are creating plastic parts and and maybe even three printing them. Next is a really cool one, volumetric latticing. Um, this one allows you to essentially create a 3D, this looks like a 3D printed, um, uh, 3D printed feature, like without the outside parts of it. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. So if we go over here to preferences, there we go, uh, and preview features. Since there's so many preview features now, we can we should do a search for it. Um, but there it is. I already checked it, but it's also an extension. But it's uh, in preview mode uh, where you can uh, just make sure you have it checked on there. Um, and then now if you go to, I believe, is it plastic? And then, yeah, there it is. Uh, modify and then volumetric lattice. Let's select this body and then instantly gives you a crazy looking, in this case, it's a gyroid and you have different ones to choose between. Which is really satisfying to look at. Um, and then not only that, you can rotate it. So if I rotate this, uh, it's hard to tell but it's rotating the direction of the lattice itself in case you want it to be linear with your model uh, to a certain degree to help with the design. And yeah, if you, if you do any 3D printing whatsoever, you'll know that on the inside, it might be a hex kind of shape. It might be a triangular shape uh, or what have you, because it's hollowed out, right, on 3D prints. Uh, so in this case, it's going to be um, something that you can actually uh, send to a 3D printer. Right now, if I hit send, it would just actually send the regular phone stand. Um, but if I went here to um, actions and create mesh, this creates this mesh, then you can send it to a 3D printer. So just keep that in mind. You can't just send this to a 3D printer. You need to just hit go one more step and just go to create mesh there. So very cool design, make it more lightweight and maybe just, just for design purposes, uh, just to to be aesthetically pleasing, potentially. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit quicker through this design advice. I'll just let this one play, uh, but essentially it, uh, Fusion will give you advice, hence the name of, of your design and how it could be manufactured more easily, if you will. Um, so right now I am selecting design advice tool, choosing the direction in which it's being pulled, uh, pulled for injection molding. And it's giving me different errors here, or not errors, giving me different warnings here of which regions may have the most strain on it and which ones may not come out successfully. Uh, so you can play more into that if you do injection molding. And just a reminder, yeah, if you have uh, the product design and manufacturing collection, you do have Fusion 360 um, as a part of it. So next here, we're taking a look at associative match. Uh, so this is essentially, let me pause it real quick. So this essentially allows, if you've ever used match before in a T-spline environment, this allows the match to update according to what uh, edge you're referencing. In this case, my lamp shade is referencing my lamp neck. So if the lamp neck updates, the lamp shade will update as well. So right now, I. I'm showing how it's going to not update. This is how it was previously, the match command was, and it did not update. You can see the neck is larger than the, than the shade there. But then if I go ahead and go to uh, create an associative match, which you'll see here, it's gonna be under modify, under match. And then I'm gonna do a couple of clicks here to to just essentially reassociate it. Let me click 
fast forward forward through it a little bit. Fast forwarding. Okay. Now, when I go to modify the neck, after I move it around a little bit, so go to modify the neck. It should update. There we go. It updated the, the shade as well. Uh, of course, there's a little uh, thing going on in the middle there, but the whole point is to show that match command updating, whereas it never did that before. So I was pretty excited about that new feature um, inside of Fusion. Uh, this one I'm, I'm going to mention, uh, I know um, we, we're a little strict on time. We just want to get through some of this, um, but tangent relationships is uh, another one um, that's new that gives uh, users the ability to, it's not a joint per se, uh, but it's, it's kind of like a, a constraint, if you will, uh, kind of forcing tangent uh, faces, um, yeah, tangent faces to be uh, aligned with each other kind of like in the image here and you can find this tool under the assemble tab um so as you can see it's not under joint it's it has its own category here um but it's similar to it in a sense so i definitely recommend playing around with that uh if you if you build assemblies and you want it to kind of react to each other uh naturally uh replace components so Look at this uh, assembly that I have here. This grip here is essentially a rigid body uh, connected to this um, part of the assembly. And if I wanted to change this grip out, I can right click on it and now use replace component. And if I have a component in my fusion, which I do, I can quickly swap it out. This one is just a different material. Uh, but I can quickly swap it out. And the nice thing about it is that it can main, if it's the same uh, part, like the same size and everything, it will maintain its relationship with the previous assembly. So now you can see I didn't do anything else. Now I'm able to still move it around uh, like nothing happened. And it was really quick. I didn't have to reassociate any joints, any rigid bodies or anything like that. It understands, hey, it's it's essentially the same part. I'm just swapping it out with another one. So that's that's a new feature. That's pretty cool. Replace component. Um, and then other ones, this is still January, by the way. January had definitely the biggest punch of all uh, the three that I'm about to go over. Uh, so towards the end of January here, uh, we have uh, it's worth uh, some worth mentioning here, toggle driven dimensions. So if you've ever done dri driven dimensions or if you're aware of driven dimensions, um, and when you create a, when you're over defining a sketch, it now allows you to choose which dimension it has priority or which dimension drives the, the sketch as opposed to um, them choosing for you. Uh, read only for me allows you to edit your models in a collaborative environment um, by making it so other people can still have access to it, but you have a read only access. It kind of like limits yourself from doing harm to the model while giving others the opportunity to, to make changes. Resolve external components. Uh, this is a handy tool that allows uh, the import of, or, or the if it's missing a reference, if your assembly is, uh, is trying to um, import or not import, trying to find other components, um, and it's giving you an error for that, um, Fusion has a, an update that helps to resolve that more easily. And hole and thread note, I'll be showing a quick one of this in just a moment, but essentially it's a leader that helps to call out holes and threads. So I'll, I'll be showing that in just a moment with this other new feature. So now I'm transitioning into March here. So here's uh, whole tables. So now just like a parts list or revision table or what have you, there's now whole tables in Fusion. So let me go into that. So here's a sheet metal part with three holes in it. We can go to tables. We can go to whole table. 
is saying select a view with an origin or select a point to set the origin. Let's make this our X, Y coordinate. And now it's saying place a whole table. So I'll just place that at the top there. And now it's giving us a whole table uh, telling us exactly what X, Y dimensions are at the center points of these holes and what type of holes they are, which is really nice. And to what I was saying earlier, you can add this hole and thread node or leader, as I, I like to call it, which essentially detects that these were holes created with the whole feature. And it's really smart like that. And it could that you could define it like that now, which is really awesome. It's really powerful, especially for those who use holes and, and need to send this out to the shop floor. It makes it way easier than having to manually type that in every time. Um, other worth mentioning is a revision table where you can show, you know, different revs and you can actually hide um, if you have, you know, A through Z and you don't want to show A through T, you can hide those revisions um, in this revision table. You also have a revision cloud, it just adds to the aesthetics and the looks of your drawing and some other uh, nice drawing features as well. There's a uh, multi export for generative design, which allows you to um, export <laughs> multiple generative design um, uh, created models that uh, generative design would create if you're familiar with that. So now you can do multiple instead of just one at a time. Uh, there's a Fusion 360 service utility, which helps with instead of having to reinstall Fusion, uh, if you're having issues with Fusion 360 for some reason, uh, this utility. Uh, you can download it uh, by doing a Google search of Fusion 360 service utility. It helps you to repair essentially Fusion 360 with more of a friend, user friendly interface. Then we have the Flex uh, in product currency. If you haven't heard of this before, it's essentially going to replace cloud credits. Um, and it's a pay as you go kind of methodology, and it expires after one year of purchasing this. And it essentially can help you to pay for not only Fusion 360 cloud credit functionality like generative design and rendering, um, but it could also uh, be used for uh, renting like a day of AutoCAD or a day of Inventor. Uh, so if you used to use network licenses or you are using network licenses uh, and you don't use it often, or if you have a lot of users that only use it once a month or once a week, uh, this may be the, the uh, route that you take. Uh, so definitely email me later about this if you'd like to learn more about the Flex in product currency. And getting to the last month here, uh, we got what, January, March, now it's in May. Um, first, we'll, we're taking a look at mesh face group display. Uh, this is uh, essentially, as it sounds, uh, you're able to define at different faces with different colors. It's kind of like uh, coloring, uh, the component coloring cycle, cycling toggle, as you see there, similar color format, um, but so good for meshes. And then adding dimension types. So let me just show a little live, you know, that's why we're here sometimes. And you guys, have, if you guys have any questions, definitely uh, let us know in the Zoom chat. Um, so here, if you want to dimension, or let me create a drawing for this. Uh, let's create it for this handle here. New drawing. Create that view. I'll create a side view there. So previously, um, so this is an arc, as you can tell, not not a not, not a clean circle. So with the new dimensions, uh, you have the ability to. That's the radius, give me a second. There it goes, arc length dimension. So you're able to select this arc and uh, create it like that. I think I messed up there a little bit, apologies for that. Uh, and you could create it on the inside as well. And then you also have the new ability for jogged radial dimension. Uh, I haven't found the need for this personally. I, I personally don't think it's too clean or it makes a lot of sense for me, um, but you have this jogged ability where you can uh, create a radii that way uh, for your 
dimensions. I personally would still stick to the regular dimension for that, um, but I'm sure there's use case scenarios for that. I just haven't found it yet, but that's there's a jogged and then there's the arc radii um, or arc link dimension, sorry, arc link dimension, uh, new dimension functionality. So if you use arcs a lot, that's just perfect for you. And then lastly, other worth mentioning uh, from this past month are uh, some new attributes and properties that were added into Fusion. An auxiliary view, uh, here's an example of one here where it's an auxiliary view, which is essentially a view looking perpendicular to, I selected this script as my um, auxiliary like point of reference right there. So it's kind of looking uh, normal to that. Um, snap fits with bosses and ribs. Uh, I kind of mentioned the ribs earlier uh, when we're creating those bosses for the plastic. Um, so that was a new feature in May, which is why we saw it uh, today. And then some other notable enhancements here. One worth mentioning is, when, remember when we replaced this grip with a with a uh, other similar grip, just a different material? You could do that now for pattern components. So if that grip was pattern, or if it was a uh, bolt like this, then you can still replace it, and you can replace all of them. Uh, it'll it'll understand that hey, these were kind of uh, pattern parts, and it's referencing the same part. So not only can you replace one component, you can replace multiple pattern components. All right, that was it for design from January to May in a nutshell. Hopefully, that was a quick and a good summary for you y'all and uh, that will be this will be posted onto our YouTube channel. Uh, with that said, I will go ahead and stop my share and I will go ahead and pass it to Chris so then he can share um, the what's new in manufacturing. So um, just before I begin, I, I'm just going to throw the safe harbor statement out here. Um, basically what this is, it's just some of the items that I might mention today, maybe in preview or internal discussions. So I just don't want to guarantee any timelines or actual development of some of these features. Um, just, just be aware that they, you know, uh, some of the stuff I am going to show, just I can't, I can't promise or guarantee anything. It's basically what I'm getting at. Okay. Uh, so for the uh, manufacturing agenda for today, uh, I am briefly just going to describe the, what the core fusion and the machining extension differences are. And I'll just kind of briefly go through just a couple of the hot topics that I've found um, in the last five months. You know, Fusion updates so quickly, right? It's, it's, uh, it's just trying to find those, uh, those few core functions or even some of the functions under the machining extension that are worth reviewing. So for those of you that um, are not aware, there is a machining extension in Fusion, um, you can see in the core offering, uh, the core offering of Fusion 360 allows, basically you could drive um, almost any equipment in the shop. So anything from a mill to a, a lathe all the way to a, you know plasma or water jet. Um, you can even operate a 3D printer with it as well. Um, the limitations, you know, I'll speak more on the milling side for at this point in time, um, up to positional. So three plus one, three plus two, um, two and a half and three axis milling. If you require that additional functionality, uh, if you've got that equipment that allows you to do simultaneous live five axis machining, the machining extension is, is what you're gonna require. Um, there's also some really intelligent or um, high-end types of toolpath strategies. Uh, one in particular is steep and shallow. Uh, this steep and shallow strategy came from um, the Dell came developers and they brought it over into Fusion. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of talk more about it uh, towards the end of this presentation. Um, also with that note, uh, toolpath trimming or editing, uh, deleting passes, moving start points. That's a, a key feature of, you know, having that absolute control when you're creating tool pass. Uh, and then there's some automated drilling and then there's also some added inspection options. So if you do have probes on your uh, CNC equipment, uh, you can actually probe on the machine and generate an inspection reports and uh, even doing some type of part of alignment. 
So just a, a brief overview of what machine extension is. Um, again, it just allows you to basically reduce a lot of time, gives you that absolute control of your tool paths. Um, and then again, it depends on what you're doing. There's um, some added inspection abilities, um, toolpath optimization, as well as some advanced tool access control. So again, I'm just gonna kind of uh, pick on a few items that I found with uh, each month. So in, in January, um, in the core offering, some of the features that came out in January were allowing the ability of turning undercuts, uh, improvements anyway, on really complex turning features. So previously you might have the uh, turning toolpath kind of jump over the undercut region, whereas uh, the new enhanced algorithms that are basically being developed for fusion, uh, more so on the turning side at this point, are allowing some more uh, ability to kind of get your tool into those undercut regions. And with that, there's some new linking functionality as well, which allows you to retract the tool uh, in a different, uh, more advanced method. And then there was some, some various fixes or, or QA, or sorry, QOL improvements or quality of life improvements in this month. Uh, just a variety of um, bug fixes. Um, on the machining extension, uh, there was the ability of moving start points that was in preview. So we'll talk more about what preview re represents when I get to uh, doing more or less a live demo later on. So this was a, a preview feature that was for the machine extension, which allows you to move start points in a closed circuit. So you can do this in the 2D side of Fusion, but on the 3D side, this just gives you that extra finite control. So um, in February, February was a bit light in terms of enhancements, but um, the post processor team was hard at work improving the available posts in Fusion. Um, on the additive side, they added post processors for LUTSPOT. And then there was about 11 quality of life improvements in February. But in case you missed it, um, on the, ex the machine extension side, oh, let me just get caught up here. On the machine extension side, um, there's a partnership with Autodesk that was announced that they're going to partner with Module Works. So, in case you don't know who Module Works is, uh, Module Works is a company that designs uh, toolpath algorithms for a lot of the big named CAD CAM companies out there on the market. This means that Fusion will, in the near future, offer the core HSM strategies, which you may all be familiar with. If you are Inventor CAM users or even Fusion users, you, you've already kind of used these in the past as well as the Delcam toolpath control. And now we're going to gain some of the ModuleWorks technology to give Fusion users the best in-class solution on the market in the CAM space. So more to come on this um, in future releases. Again, uh, I can't promise any timelines or anything like that, but just uh, kind of keep an eye on what's happening here with Fusion on this, on this uh, front. So for March, um, you know, I guess you can kind of beat me up after this later on. I know this was kind of a sore spot for some users, but there was a, a realignment. So basically what, um, with the announcement of ModuleWorks, um, Autodesk decided that kind of needs to be a rebalance with the manufacturing space between the core offering and its extension offering. Um, we made a difficult decision to remove some of the simultaneous strategies from the core offering and place them in the extension. Um, but any positional toolpath access movements remain in the core offering. So you can do up to three plus one or three plus two in the core offering. Um, if you need to get into any simultaneous movement, that's now going to be solely uh, in the machine extension. Um, just so you're aware, toolpath wrapping or wrap toolpaths remain uh, in the core offering. So if you're already doing that, uh, you don't have to jump into the machine extension for that. Uh, th this was a decision to basically to establish a better way of discussing uh, toolpath availability with new customers and aligned to most other CAM companies on the market. So still overall great value of attaining a good CAM system with full five access control for roughly you know, 2K a year. So in the extension side, uh, toolpath trimming is 
been moved out of preview as well as move start points, which I previewed previously just discussed in a previous slide is now out of preview as well. And again, I'll, I will kind of touch on what these do uh, towards the end of my presentation here. Moving into April, uh, again, another kind of a light month again, but uh, post processors uh, got some attention once again. Um, you can check online as to what these changes are if you're interested, especially if you're using some of the posts that are in the, uh, the cloud. Uh, the holder library has gone through kind of a little bit of an overhaul that allows you to collapse um, the different tool libraries, I mean, or the holder libraries. This seems trivial, but, um, you know, for me, even going, jumping into the holder library, it was, it, it was kind of frustrating having to kind of move up and down a list looking for exactly what you need. And then there was a, another 11 various fixes for quality of life improvements. On the extension side, uh, they now added an ability to restrict tool axis movement before axis. Uh, this again is in preview. Uh, and I believe it's only with uh, the flow strategy at this point. I'm not sure if they're planning on moving this into other strategies, but just keep that in mind. So as for May, this was a, a rather big update um, to the core users and for the extension. Um, so new accessibility options. Um, there's a little video here kind of playing uh, down below in the bottom left-hand corner, which just allows the programmer in a positional format to visually see what they can and can't access uh, with that tool access position. The video also describes this process and, and this, the whole purpose here is to eliminate any guesswork by the programmer to improve the overall experience in Fusion 360 when programming. So the tool database, um, the legacy tool database has been retired for the new updated um, tool database. So hopefully you've had some time to get familiar with the newer tool database because um, it's now the old database has been retired. And then there's been some updated tool platforms, which allows the users to store more information in fields as default. Previously, I think you can only store um, numerical values in fields. So this now allows you to save any menu items or any checkboxes as defaults. Um, there was a way to do it, but it was kind of a roundabout way. This will now be directly in the tool platform. So those little three dots that you see next to um, the particular functions that you access, you'll, you'll now have those across the board. Um, as for the extension, uh, another big update on the five axis side. So multi-axis tool paths for 3D strategies is in preview. Um, what does this mean? Uh, so this basically allows most of the core Fusion 360 three-axis tool paths to give the ability to modify it in a full five-axis form. So there'll be an added um, tab within the tool path forms to be able to um, push that to a, a live five-axis tool path. <clears throat> this is kind of moving in the same line as like something like Power Mold does where a lot of the strategies can be programmed in a three axis, four axis, or even five axis format. So it just gives the users more flexibility to keep the tool overhang short and take advantage of the reason why they purchased that high-end equipment. Um, before I jump into my uh, actual demonstration, if some of the items I've been mentioning are in preview, there is the ability to access some of these preview features. There's also a way that you can actually sign up to be in on the insider program, which allows you to gain access to new features before they're issued to the general public, uh, know when the updates are coming and get rights to the insider lounge, which allows you to converse with um, Autodesk employees and the development team. Um, it's a two-way partnership. Since we like to hear feedback on features that have not yet been added to see if there are any items that need attention before the actual release into the software. So if you're interested, uh, you can just search for it, Google search it. Uh, you can use the link there um, on the bottom of this page, or alternatively, you can reach out to myself or even uh, Kati for this information. So with that being said, I'm just gonna kind of jump into the software and kind of show you some of these uh, functions that are in within the uh, manufacturing uh, extension. Uh, and then we can take on some questions uh, if you have them towards the end. Okay, so give me one second. I'm just gonna jump over to Fusion. Okay. So I mentioned some of the higher end strategies that come with the machining extension. 
Uh, I think Brian already kind of showed you this, the machine extension, if you need to access it, it's this little plug icon here, which allows you to see all the extensions. And if you want to see everything that's involved in the machine extension, you can kind of tag this and kind of read more and more about uh, what's available in the machine extension. Okay, so we just kind of populate these uh, couple strategies here. I'm not gonna really calculate anything in real time just for time constraints. So I've already got some toolpaths that are kind of already calculated, but uh, the first toolpath strategy I wanna explain is steep and shallow. So what is steep and shallow? So you can see this region on my part, it's a, a pretty complex area. Uh, traditionally to program something like this on a traditional uh, cam software, this could take, you know, upwards of three, four, five, even, you know, 10 or 12 different toolpaths just to get this job done. With steep and shallow, it allows me to pick one region. So if I just go into edit mode here, I've actually just selected this area as my boundary. I wanna machine everything inside and allows me to dictate how I wanna machine the steep regions and how I wanna machine the shallow regions. So. Um, anything that's kind of on a vertical stage, which is the steep, we're going to just uh, do like a, a 2D contour, or sorry, a 3D contour. Um, anything that's kind of on the shallower range, uh, we have the control or flexibility of choosing if I want to do a parallel pass or uh, a scallop. And then you've got individual control on both of those strategies in here. Um, full five axis capabilities as well. So let me just cancel that and kind of see that strategy here. Um, let me just simulate this strategy just so you kind of get an understanding of some items that might pop up. So you can see as I run into simulation mode, um, I could potentially start seeing some, some issues arise down here. So if I kind of snap my tool to that location, you know, I, I can obviously see that there's a, a problem here with the tool touching the part or, you know, gouging the part. So another really nice feature about steep and shallow is that I can, this is the exact same toolpath. The only thing I did was if I go into the edit mode here once again, if I look at my multi-axis page, all I did was turn on an option called collision avoidance, which will move out of any type of gouge or collision with the holder or the shank of the, of the tool to a specified value. So my specified value is in the tool page I basically want to maintain that I at least have a hundred thousands of holder clearance and 40 thousands of shank clearance at all times. So those are two little pieces of information I've added was just one checkbox. There are other ways I can avoid collisions. I'm just using the automatic mode, let fusion kind of figure things out for me. And then I'm just basically giving fusion kind of like a buffer zone of how much I want to abide by. So just by adding those and recalculating the strategy or the tool path. Now, if I simulate this on the machine tool, uh, this is a Haas UMC 750, by the way. We can kind of see as, you know, I getting towards that same area where there was a collision, it's automatically avoiding that collision by the values that I placed in there. So it's a really easy way of a three axis program or someone doesn't have a lot of simultaneous live five axis toolpath. Um, knowledge from previously, it just allows um, any user to basically program by five. Okay, so let me just close out of that. Um, continue on corner finishing. So this is a, a newer strategy that was released, um, I, I want to say the end of last year. Um, it just kind of took on uh, a different approach as what Pencil had to offer. So there's a new corner finishing strategy. Again, this was developed um, to improve some of the functionality that was already there. Uh, so here's my original tool path. Okay, but as you can see, again, if I were to simulate this, there's obviously gonna be an issue because of the holder I'm using and where I need to actually access. So there is a function within the modify section here where I can just simply swap a tool. So if I were to just access this function, I'm not recalculating the tool path. Actually, let me just cancel that. This is the one I want to do. So, so I'm not recalculating the tool path. All I'm doing is selecting a new tool from my uh, tool database. So in this case, I'm going to grab this slimmer tool. Hit select and just hit okay. 
and you can see it swaps that tool, no generation required. So even though I'm using a slimmer tool, I still might have an issue with um, the tool colliding. So if I were to simulate this strategy once again, Okay, so if I bring it into an area like so, there's, again, some more collisions that I need to, to uh, address here. So let me just cancel that, close. So again, I'm not gonna recalculate this tool path, but this is the same tool path. And all I did on this strategy is apply the automatic collision avoidance once again. So you can see different methods of getting from point A to point B using some of these higher end tool path editing options. Last but not least, there's some, some issues here where potentially I don't want this strategy to access these two pockets. So if I look at this last strategy, there's an option here to delete segments that I don't actually require. So if I were to select this option, I'm just going to turn off the model here so I can kind of see it. I have access to all of my strategies and I can just kind of window around the, the uh, segments that I don't care about. I can hit okay. So those segments are gone and I'm gonna repeat the same thing on this side as well. So let's delete segments once again. Let's select these segments as well as maybe some segments over here that I don't require. And there's also some segments on the outside of my part that I don't require as well. And just so you're aware, anytime you do any type of edit, there's a little pencil icon next to the strategy indicates that I've done some edit and those are all recorded in the timeline. So I can always go back and modify these if I choose to. You can see when I highlight over it, I can see all the segments that I deleted. If I need to modify those selections, I can always go back and edit them just like it was on, on the design side. Everything is kind of recorded uh, parametrically. So here's another strategy that I created just to mill this, uh, this rib out. And you can see I got a lot of extra uh, cutting time here. So if I wanted to run this um, on the machine, you know, I'm getting some extra runtime that I don't require. So there are some functions here where I can actually delete or sorry, trim away function um, portions of the toolpath that I don't require. So let me just create a section here. Oops, sorry about that. Is it okay? Just so I can see what I'm doing here. There's my toolpath. And then I'm going to trim this toolpath with a variety of different methods. One is just sketching a polygon, one is using a plane, and one is using a, a boundary or a sketch. So in this case, I'm just going to select the areas that I don't want. Let's save that, accept it, and then I'm going to trim away this side as well, and we'll accept that. And I wanna keep the outside. So anything outside of these polygons, I wanna keep. I have option of keeping both or the inside. Okay, so there's my, my tool path where I trimmed away the excess that I don't require. Last but not least, I was mentioning about moving start points. So, if we were to go into the strategy form here and go into linking, there is an option to change the entry positions. Um, unfortunately, with Fusion, I only have the ability of selecting like endpoints or even maybe, you know, depending. I can pick somewhere on this line, but if I wanted to move the start points somewhere in between here, it's kind of hit or miss. So in order to kind of have that finite control, we have the option of moving entry points. I basically just need to create um, a theoretical line that kind of crosses all of those toolpath segments. And you can see that that's where those, all those points are going to, to kind of get moved to. And we're going to hit okay. All right, so before I finish off here with uh, my presentation, um, it, just in case you aren't aware, if you go up to your profile over here and go into preferences, Preview features, kind of the things I was just talking about here are um, anything in the green 
indicates that these are public preview features where they're close to being released into the software. So you can try these out. Anything with these um, this gold lock here, that's that's kind of reserved for the insider previews. So it's kind of what, the, what I was mentioning in that last slide there before I jumped into this presentation. And then there's also functions that are solely reside uh, from the manufacturing extension. So if you haven't used these or haven't kind of explored these, I uh, highly encourage you to do so. So with that being said, sorry, I, I took so long there, but uh, I just want to thank everybody for allowing me in.